Hey folks, welcome back. Got another episode for everyone. This is the engineering side of data. I'm your host, Bob Hafner. I'm joined by Michael Meyer. We're going to be talking about data catalogs today. Some of you may recognize Mike from previous episodes. He was my first episode when we talked about cloud data warehouses. Be sure to check out that episode if you haven't already, and he even joined me as a co-host for a couple as well. And But today, we're going to be talking about data catalogs, as I mentioned. Mike, thanks for coming on. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Bob. The uh, Yeah, so, um, you know, my name is Michael Meyer. I've done various roles um, in the uh, data space from, you know, engineer to architect to business intelligence developer, and uh, recently kind of uh, changed even a little bit further, kind of using all those past experiences to do more of a, a marketing, a product marketing role. So um, I'm now a technical product marketing manager at Alation. That's my latest gig. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thanks, Bob. All right. Well, as usual, we're going to dive right into these questions. I always start off with the broad one. What is a data catalog? Yeah, you know, so to me, uh, that a data catalog is really that place where you're able to um, gather information about all your, you know, your corporate um, data assets, whether, you know, whether it's uh, um, databases, um, analytics like dashboards, reports, uh, make, you know, even files um, make up things that anywhere where information can be stored and needs to be brought in and can be cataloged uh, so that it can be shared. Um, throughout the organization, I think it's kind of that that idea is it's really trying to create that repository of information. Excellent. So it's every source you have, every target you have, all the inform all the meta information about those various things are stored in these data catalogs. Right. You know, and, and that you know, it's it's amazing to see. Uh, just kind of thinking back, even just in the five years I've kind of been around and seeing different, you know, four or five years with data catalogs, how the maturity of the space is just, it's, you know, taken in off. There's just so many things now that five years ago, you would have said, I can't believe we have these features now. So, I mean, just kind of staying on par with, with, with everything that's going on. It's like you said, is having, you know, a broad um, range of connector, connectors so that you can actually get to all the different sources, whether you're in the cloud or you still have all those, you know, on-prem sources that most people still have today um, is, Im is important, um, you know, to, to be able to get that metadata and to be able to keep that metadata current. Right. Um, and then, you know, then beyond that, there's you just all of the, the things that you look for in terms of like automation um, helping you out because, you know, Everybody's got so much data, and trying to be able to curate this all of this manually is a is a really uphill battle. So, you know, those those you know having automation is almost a, an essential, and you know, using most of the the tools nowadays have have some help. Whether you know, in terms of like machine learning that help drive that that automation. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. you know just things like that to me are just like you know are um, things that you might have take for granted today you wouldn't have necessarily seen maybe those five five years ago yeah. so where does a data catalog fit in and we talk about data governance or data management tools mm -hmm. or just data management in general how does data catalog fit into all that yeah so if you think about it it, it really is kind of a i always think of it kind of as that center stage or um because if if everything is built correctly around the catalog, um, then it all becomes kind of transparent. So for example, when you start to talk about governance, if you think about it, the most important thing um, about governance is really being able to understand the data, the sensitivity of the data. But beyond just knowing that, is having a, you know, a, something that can help guide you um, in saying, hey, this is sensitive before you use it, or um, um, be basically um, having it integrate, you know, with systems where you may have things and policies created that actually can work with, you know, like Snowflake nowadays has masking policies. So let's say being able to do and, and integrate with that. So it's really that blend, I would say. So if you think about as you flow from 
governance, it's almost like having governance taking place, but from an end user's perspective, not um, knowing that it, there's this strict command and control. It shouldn't be that way. It should be more of a people approach, you know, kind of lighter weight and protecting the organization's assets, but yet at the same time, not really being this, this uh, you know, kind of a hard, hard pressed or uh, hardcore type of governance. Also then, as you were talking about in terms of like um, other data management, the things that become clear too is that data quality um, is to me is gotta be at the top of the list. And, you know, having data quality integrated in the catalog to me is important. So if you start to reference, let's say a, a table and you all of a sudden see some quality information about a particular column, it may, you know, may make you think twice about is that, for example, is that something I want to use inside of a machine learning model, knowing that the quality of that data is not, uh, you know, what I expected it to be. So having that all integrated into one central place um, is important. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be one tool. Um, it can be, you know, you know, platforms that actually integrate best of breed components like that and bring them in. So, but I think that still is the, where things are, you know, are heading. Um, I would say a few years back, that was one of the, the things that was on everybody's mind. If I go best of breed, how am I going to tie these together? And I think you're starting to see a lot of that going on, well, going on now. Um, and also there always are going to be those um, complete platforms that will have their own versions of, uh, you know, governance and quality built in. Gotcha. So, yeah, I, I think one of the examples of just a data catalog and a bare bones one of that is actually I covered it in one of my recent episodes with blue data catalog it just contains information. It's got the schema, maybe some version information, but that's it. So it's pretty bare, yeah. effective and reliable, but very bare bones. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like that there's, there's those models, but then there's a bunch of else, other models or other tools out there that are kind of more um, full featured, I guess I would say. Yeah. If you think about it, there's, there's so many different things. Um, call them kind of uh, catalog adjacent to the main product. So if you look at a lot of your, uh, um, you know, like your uh, machine learning tools, a lot of times they'll have a catalog that kind of talks about the data sets that are provided that people have curated, you know, or gave basic information about, um, you know, you have things like reporting systems will also have their own kind of catalog and, you know, others along the way, um, whether they're a, you know, MDM or a, um, data quality may have some of those features too, but like, as you said, does it provide all of the, the things that are, are necessary really to, um, really to gain adoption and to really be, get a lot of use in the organization. And that's really the, the, the key to it. One of the difficult things about, about even knowing where to get started is, is, is trying to, uh, kind of analyze, um, your data. And sometimes organizations have you know, basically use cases that say, hey, we're going off and, you know, customer data is the most important thing. Let's go do that domain, which is great. Or maybe it's a, a financial area that needs to be done right away. But I, re I remember back and we're going to go back to the old days, Bob. Oops, I lost some lighting here. And uh, so um, I don't know if you remember back when there were things like called um, database audit tools. Um, and I'm trying to think of some of the names of the ones that I use, but for example, um, they would go out and actually show you, you know, what tables in your databases were getting a hit and kind of the frequency. And so I know, boy, this is going back 10 years. I would use those as even making, um, some, you know, evaluations as to the reporting system I was working on, where should I spend more of my time on something that's not being gotcha. used, you know, very much not. Well, if you think about that then too, in terms of the, the, the data catalog space, you almost need something like that to help you get started, right? Something that says, you know, hey, here's our most popular um, assets that are in the organization. These are being used the most. And um, that gives you a clue as to maybe where you should start first if you're struggling how to get started. So having that built into the catalog too, being able to go out and and I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of like scraping your, um, your transaction logs or your query logs that you have in your relational systems and finding that information out, kind of like the old auditing system you 
database audits used to do. So, you know, it's, it's okay. adding that, that kind of value too, because, you know, everybody's going to um, have, um, you know, um, an initial, like, hey, let's hit the ground running. We think we want to go here, but but when it comes to, uh, you know, organizations that have just massive amounts of data, you really have to be able to focus on the most critical and most used first. That makes sense. So a little bit of a data profiling aspect to some of these as well. Yeah, that, usage and, that's, and that's data quality. Important. Yes, that is another important part um, of adding on top of data quality. Like you said, profiling is so in, so important and. Um, as an engineer, I think sometimes I take for granted and don't think about it. But then um, when I actually see other people start to use that information, kind of understand what's going on, I think it, it's it's critical. And, you know, there, there's always the fun yeah. stories. Like um, I remember one time working through some reports and I was seeing that this particular you know field was being used in several reports, let's say between five and 10 reports. And lo and behold, it's never said it was a hundred percent null all the time. So it's like, well, yeah. the question then becomes is, is somebody expecting something to be in there and it's not getting said as a flaw of the system or was it just never implemented or what's, you know, what's the story, what's the story behind yeah. it? So yeah, you're right. Profiling is another huge aspect that yeah. is so important. Yeah. I, yeah, I could definitely say that with data quality. And then that's, just the, you brought up about the usage patterns as well. That's also very interesting. I could definitely see how that could guide an organization in terms of um, where to go, where to put efforts into, right? Right. If our, yeah. you know, our CRM information is being used regularly, you know, do we need to, um, are we, are we you know, quote unquote, good for now? Can we iterate to something else? Maybe something's not being used at all. What's going on? Did not meet expectations. I think it'd be very useful when you're discussing the the, the content of your backlog and, and your next steps on uh, what you're going to be working on. So, yeah, yeah that's I remember interesting. Quite a long time ago, you know, it's like um, in it was more from a developer perspective. We had goals in one organization I worked at is we had a lot of databases and the newer ones were being documented. So you'd had source descriptions on tables and columns, which was great to get started. We had a lot of old ones where, um, you know, it was like, well, how are we going to do this? And I, you know, I said, well, let's again, try to figure out what are the marquee areas and then just take a little bit, you know, can we do each release? Can we get 25% of this area done or something like that? And, you know, it becomes an interesting thing because it builds, right? So the interesting part is as you start to add that content, and people start to consume it and see it, um, the value proposition goes up. So the more value you know, they're getting out of it, then if people are a little bit more willing to put some more time and resources to it. Um, so that was kind of an interesting learning experience. I think it still still applies today. So you can't you, you can't boil the whole ocean. We know that. So finding things which are popular, um, things that you know are important, and kind of setting some goals. And then kind of measuring against those goals, right? So if I'm trying to say I'm going to do 25%, um, I hope my catalog can kind of show me how I'm doing. You know, am I going to, am I 5% of the way there, my goal? Am I 10% of the way there? You know, those are those are things that I think, um, me personally, they energize me if I can actually see I'm making progress. Um, if I just have this heap of work to do and it just is like, no end in sight without yeah. communication what you're yeah. doing. I think that becomes a little bit different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can definitely appreciate that. That kind of segues into one of my questions about challenges of maintaining a data catalog. What are, what have you come across? Yeah, you know, a lot of them are really good about keeping the uh, metadata updated. Um, so that usually is not a problem. So it's kind of like if you think about any other system. So uh, most catalogs are going to provide means to to store other more, you know, more than just a basic description. Um, they probably have some glossaries, terms and glossaries, and they probably also have something like, um, you know, maybe somewhere where you can write maybe like a, a short, I don't want to call it a story, maybe an article. Um, so a little bit further information. So if you think about it, it's kind of like, having your company's documentation system inside and trying to figure out 
Um, how often am I going out and seeing if this information is still current? So there is there is that challenge, um, being able to go back and, and look at that. Um, one of the things I think that is good, again, is if people are truly actively using it, um, is hopefully there's a way to um, collaborate and at least say, hey, I think this term is out of date. What do we need to do to update it? And, you know, knowing um, somebody that's kind of like a steward of that or, you know, maybe he's worked with it, then you can kind of kind of be able to keep that up to date. But keeping information up to date is, we know, is difficult, right? So any kind yeah. of documentation is always is hard. But I would say from, at least from the perspective of metadata, yeah, um, it becomes, um, it, that part's taken care of. The other interesting thing is there's some some tools will provide ways to um, be able to be able to search and as new things are being added already provide let's say I always think about like in an organization you you know if you have multiple databases over the years something as simple as an order ID might be called ten different versions of it right or mm -hmm. spelled out O R D R underscore ID yeah purchase order, order. it's it's or you know it's just actually. So having one a place where you can kind of define that information once, and then the system says, hey, I see that coming in, I'll apply all the characteristics of what this data is so that I only have to maintain it in one place. Because I know that's that I've heard that concern from a lot of people as they said, um, start you know their journey and trying to curate. It's like, well, I have, let's say I have customer name, you know, all over the place. How am I going to keep the definitions in sync? And so there, you know, having something where you can yeah. define once and have the system kind of watch for that coming in and take care of updates. Or if I, that way, if I need to update it in one place, those are huge. Those are huge factors um, that you should consider when you're kind of looking at a data catalog. Yeah, that, I guess that's per yeah, that's probably pretty predictable when it comes to data catalogs, right? That is the the biggest challenge of keeping a program going is making sure that um, the updating of it is as smooth as possible, as efficient as possible, as easy as possible. Exactly. Yeah, yeah those are yep. all key. Yep. So how do you get how do you get started? Someone, you know, if you were to have a colleague come to you and say, "Hey, you know what? We're, we bought this data catalog. We want to implement it." What are some things you'd say, man, this is what I would do day one, right off the bat? Yeah, you know, I think, I think one of the best things to do is, is kind of sit down and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of create, you need to create a plan, right, a little bit. So first of all, um, it was interesting. I talked with, um, when we were, when my first time going through a data catalog, I talked with a lot of other people going through the same thing. And, you, you know, you get the lessons learned, right? Um, some people went out and tried to do metadata extraction on everything that they had and just kind of get this huge, all this influx of information, but they didn't take the time to think look through little things, right? Like, oh, we have this ETL schema. Do I really want to have that in my catalog? Does it really add value? It's like, probably not. Um, you probably want to focus more on, you know, your analytic data and, and some of the other things. Oh. And be able so to maybe read. some staging table that's involved yeah. in some process. Is that necessary? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, exactly. I gotcha. So again, you start out, don't go after the ocean, you know, don't try to boil the ocean right away. Come up with a plan of what you think is most important. Um, you know, especially a couple of use cases and then kind of plan out how you look at, um, you know, each of, of your areas of information, um, you know, at those key critical levels, like at a table and column, are there certain things that today you might gather um, in another place, extra metadata about them that you want to, to bring into the catalog? Um, do, how do you class, so a typical one people always think about right away is classifying PII. Do you have any, you know, do you create, do you have a place today where you're, where you're doing that? Can you create a you know, like a, a, a custom field or something in your catalog now to be able to do that. So it's all, all tied in there. Um, and then I think the biggest thing is to be, to be aware of as you start to kind of plan the, the real implementation that could be going on, you better be planning in your organization kind of a, um, 
you know, change awareness of what's going on because most people are not going to understand really, you know, well, why, why are we doing this? What are you asking of me? Um, you know, you really need to start out with, with that. So kind of start out with an awareness campaign and saying, we're getting a data catalog. Here's all the key benefits that we're going to get. We're going to be able to have information in one place. You're going to be able to trust it. You won't have, you're going to have an easy search mechanism to find it. Um, it versus, really highlight the benefits. What's in yes, it for them? Absolutely. And then as you kind of work through it, it's again about that value proposition. You need to be able to really continue to communicate as you're curating and, and getting areas done that that's adding value so that to others can start consuming it and get them kind of energized too and wanting to say, hey, yeah, that's that's great. How do I contribute to the next area that we need to, to build out? So that's yeah. the kind of care and feeding I think you really need to be able to do, you know, and uh, some organizations, um, you know, because most organizations, I would say, don't have that kind of, you know, title of somebody called a data steward, right? They just have people yeah. in the organization that know a little bit about the data. So if they if they can share, you know, what they know and then have others come along and, you know, have, you know, conversations and be able to to keep it, you know, keep yeah. iterating through it and, and evolving it. That's, you know, that's kind of the best case is being yep. being able to do that. But uh, yeah, those are some of the key things. I think that my, my biggest thing was, is, you know, from my perspective, like this data catalog, wow, it's great. Let's get going, but to have others around you, it, it takes a while to, to really do the awareness and get them to get everybody yeah. on board and then to start doing training. Start the awareness well in advance of trying to say, yeah. hey, now the catalog's in house, let's start training. We're, what are we training on? I don't know what, what this thing's even about, so. Yeah, no, I can, that certainly makes sense. And I I'd agree, I think if I were to rephrase the, the data steward aspect. Yeah, there is, I think every organization has those unofficial data stewards. They're, they're the ones that have been around for a long time that are in charge of something that they're the go-to person of like, where, where does this live? What is, what does this field mean? How do I get to this uh, element of data? Those are the folks that need to be tapped and, and uh, yeah. And then into the catalog, right? That, you know, that uh, type of knowledge. Yeah, exactly. And it's, because then, then you're you're able to capture it and, and get that you know subject matter expert type of information, and it, it's a it's in a living you know centralized place because you know organizations turn over a lot of times pretty fast, and you know yep. the day that you're going, you're looking in notes, and it's like, well, yeah. he, it says Barry knows how to do all these these existing reports. Um, where's Barry at? Oh, well, yep. we left the company about a year ago. Yep. It's like, oh, okay. Yep. That's... But you're right. So there's a lot of roles that can really fall into that. Um, and they're not technical roles. They're a lot, most of the times they're business roles that um, I always think about. I worked at a, a leasing software company and uh, I worked with a product manager that was developing a new, a new um, part of our application. And as we we're trying to put together the specs for um, that application, I mean, just a wealth of knowledge, been in the industry, could describe all the terms. And, you know, those are the people that you really need to lean into a little bit. They don't have to do all the work, but they can lead yeah. you to the right understanding to make yeah. sure that you're doing that, um, getting the information captured. So, yeah, agree there. Um, you know, there and there are organizations that do have the, the formal title, but um, I would say there's still yeah. majority probably probably lean the other way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then, you know, you touched on another important aspect, and I think that's just really selling the benefits, right? And I do think that's what sets apart the new breed of data catalog from some of the older ones where, uh, meaning the, the older catalogs, the older way of doing things was data is one way in, big push, everything goes in, and then that's it, nothing ever gets used. But I think like the newer breed ones like Alation and some of the other ones are do an excellent job of promoting the benefit and uh, making that accessible, making it easy to get information in and easy to get it back out as well. Right, and I think they're, yeah. you know, and a lot of the new players too, I think are everybody's really out there to cover the spectrum of roles, right? Um, 
so whether, you know, business people are always first to mind, but, you know, in fi- you know, financial institutions, you're going to have your key people um, in finance departments and, and risk and different things. Um, you know, all kinds of different industries are going to have different roles that need it. But also from a, a technology perspective, it's, it's interesting. I've talked to a, a few different people and, you know, um, whether you're a data engineer or maybe even a solutions engineer, having that information there is, is valuable. Um, I've talked to a couple people that, you know, have looked at saying like, you know, they, as they're building out solutions, they would like to, to make sure that, for example, the definitions are done in one place like of data. So whether it's at the table level or at a, let's say a a web service contract that it's consistent um, and then it's easy to follow throughout the organization. So utilizing even the information there goes beyond into into a lot of technical roles too. And so I think that's kind of, um, you know, other areas that maybe at first didn't think think about as much. I, yeah. I thought of them as more contributors, but consumers, I, I, you know, abs- absolutely. I think especially with, from, you know, people that are trying to, you know, enhance their applications, they truly do need to understand the data. So the data catalog should be the perfect place to go to. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that is a, a little surprising consumer or a benefactor of uh, the data, uh, data catalog uh, program. Interesting. And we, we've talked about a handful of features of the data catalog already, data profiling, data quality scores, um, schemas, that's the register description glossaries. Uh, yeah, like I said, we've highlighted a number of them so far. But what are some of those other ones we haven't covered so far? Yeah, you know, another one that's important in um, at varying degrees, again, if you're a very technical person, you might want to have more detailed lineage if you can be able to trace back and kind of see, you know, um, at a glance, first of all, at a glance, where, where what kind of sources are feeding a report or something like that, and then maybe even detail more down to the column level. But, you know, business people may just need to know, hey, what sources are feeding into it. So lineage is a, an interesting component. Um, Along the, the lines of that, again, whether that's another one, there's so many different tools out there, whether you are, um, you know, have a lineage tool, just being able to hook it into your catalog is important, or if the catalog has lineage, being able to use it. Um, the other thing that's been interesting, and I don't didn't think about it, here's another one I didn't think about, is um, having some kind of query tool attached to the catalog. And um, at first, when I was working with catalogs, that was not even a thought. I was like, well, we have all these reporting tools, we have these ad hoc whatever tools. And then one day kind of starts to dawn on you as you're trying to put things together. Um, I was actually working on trying to come up with some data quality rules and was working against the data source. And um, so I ran some you know, basic queries and came up with some things. And so I sh- just shared them with the business owner, like, don't see it in the application. I don't know what you're, you're pointing to. And I'm like, well, I'm pointing to the table that holds this. Oh, yeah, that was deprecated two years ago. You shouldn't be using that one. <laughs> so imagine you're yeah. inside of a query edit tool. And as you're using IntelliSense, you know, you're typing in, oh, yeah. yep, there's the table I want to use. But then as soon as you hit that table, it comes up with a warning saying, hey, this has been deprecated. Instead of using table X, you should be using table Y. Just oh, wow. think yeah. of how powerful yeah. that is, right? And how much time and frustration that can save people. Um, yeah. So having something like that integrated, in, or let's say maybe even it comes to the point where it says, oh, warning, um, you're referencing a table that um, as of today, uh, has a, a bad spike of data quality issues, you may want to contact so-and-so to, to check and see if it's okay to use it. Yeah. So, I mean, those yeah, are that makes perfect sense. Yeah. the integration points that really drive home, um, you know, the things that we, we, we take, you know, we, we run things and we hope that it's of yeah. the quality. We hope we're pointing to the right thing. But this takes yeah. hope out of the equation, and then you don't get that backlash when you're going into a meeting and saying, yeah. hey, I just ran this report, and here's the numbers. It's like, where did you get those? Those were completely yeah. wrong. They're, 
what's where you know what are you getting what are your what is your source of the information yeah oh i'm using so-and-so well yeah that's been we haven't used that for two years so i don't know what, why why you would be using that so you know it's all those kind of scenarios right yeah. to, to really to really make it clear to to what in and kind of guide you to that you know that uh trusted current data i guess and so having that kind of in a integration to me is is more than powerful it just it, it gives you that confidence right so when you're when you're writing yeah. queries or when you're trying to pull data about something you say according to what i'm doing i have the a better confidence that this is the right data versus hell you know so-and-so told me to go try this out um so yeah having that that to me is, yeah. is very important yeah i could that makes um that's that's fair that's pretty obvious um the benefit of that if you are i i think um you would think that most of the time when people are querying information from their various sources and and looking for insights or perhaps making a dashboard for somebody else to consume that uh that type of data catalog information isn't in front of them all right mike so what, what percentage of data catalog content is automatically populated versus stuff you have to manually enter in? Yes, yeah. so as we, we kind of discussed early on, I think the, the, the biggest portion of course is gonna be your, um, anything from a metadata perspective, you know, all the characteristics of the data. Um, and then, you know, a, a good catalog should allow you to basically be able to things that maybe are occur multiple places to define it once and apply it. But if you're going to get into the kind of the rich side of the catalog and really being able to provide a lot of value, that's going to be, you know, your manual, um, you know, curation, of okay. like creating articles or, you know, information um, chapters about different pieces of it, things within the, within your databases. Um, same way when it comes to like governance in terms of, Gotcha. Um, you know, taking your policy documents and bringing them into your catalog. I mean, it's a gr it's a great thing to do because now it's tied directly to the data. But those are those are manual steps. So I think one of the things that you see um, is more and more creative ways on how to automate some of these things um, as as each year goes by. So that's okay. that's that that that's right now kind of the state of things. That makes sense. So really, the I guess the the data governance, like you mentioned, the data management, that's that aspect of it. You have to, most of the time, you have to enter that, that information manually, right? That's where you're linking and saying these two mm -hmm. things are the same. But all the, I guess, the the grunt work, all the, hey, go find these sort or locate these sources, pull in the schema, keep track of the versions, you know, pulling all this meta information, that's all done automatically by most catalogs, I would imagine. Yeah, exact, exactly. Okay. All of that kind of stuff is, yeah, it's definitely par for the course for all the kind of catalogs that are out there today. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, I know we've, we've touched on this, this idea that, you know, data catalogs have been around for a long time, right? The, the old school ones, uh, they were, good places, good buckets to hold things, maybe not the easiest to make use of. Uh, a lot of that's been solved by some of the newer tools, the newer data catalogs out there. They've brought for a lot of features that uh, users can take advantage of. What does that next generation of data catalogs look like? Where do we go from here? How does it get better? Yeah, you know, there's been, and you're probably well aware of this, been a lot of discussions about data mesh and, and data fabric, right? And if, if you think about a world where um, you're trying to be able to access data from anywhere within within your organization, um, being able to really have an idea of how all this comes together, the metadata becomes so important. And it has to be actively kept up and, and being able to be in the forefront to be able to use. So if you think about like, uh, a data mesh, I, you know, if I'm trying to pull across a couple different data products and trying to pull things out, um, I need to know the most current information about that in order to even have any chance of being successful. So the catalog can really become that central focal point um, to even help enhance, um, you know, kind of what's being 
coined, I guess, as active, uh, you know, metadata. Um, so with, so I think, I think really in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I think about today or I saw a picture of the, the new uh, telescope that went up with the crazy cool pictures mm -hmm. of way out in the universe. And, and so you think about it as our, our data landscape expands and keeps expanding and getting further, you still have to have that central focal point um, to be able to help guide you to all of those places in the universe, right? Um, so I, I think the catalog is going to continue to play a major role in that and just even become more important, especially in, in like I say, in the era of data mesh and data fabric. Yeah. That makes sense. So as things become more, more of a decentralized approach, you know, you're saying that it would be needs to be more of a data catalog has to be present there to help keep everything. I guess everybody on the same page, right? Yeah, For all these different you know, players and, and then yep, making exactly. you know, creating so, data you know, modeling. Yes. So yeah. let's say you're just you're, you know you're working on one data product. I'm working on another, and we're trying to do things and connect. Um, yeah. You know things that make sense and don't make sense right you know it goes still goes down to the the bottom line of like um so i'm like hey bob i need to hook up my whatever product with yours how am i going to connect in and do things and i you know so right away in no. order to automate it you have to trust the metadata right so if i'm going to jump across let's say and join into something into some product that you have i have to make sure that the the, the data types and everything else align in order to make that connection point right Gotcha. Um, so to me, that's where really, so if you think about it, these processes are going to have to read into something and say, because they can't go through every database and scan quickly and say information schemas. Oh, no, you don't have that. That's a Microsoft thing or a whatever thing, right? I need to find out what that thing is for yours. But if you have it in a kind of a non, um, kind of in a universal language, like a catalog to be able to come through and say, oh, yeah, okay, here we found it. Yep, you're in line, this is what we need. Continue, you know, continue to move forward servicing uh, those data requests. So yeah. it's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna get really interesting um, w with some of these things, but it, it doesn't, you know, that's kind of the future, but it just continues to solidify that having a catalog and understanding a lot about your data is, is important. Yeah. Yeah, we've certainly seen a spike of data sources in recent years, a variety of them, meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, yeah, now that, yeah, again, with these decentralized approaches, uh, we're seeing a lot more players. And, uh, yeah, like we talked about, yeah, that's where a data catalog would be, would be pretty useful to keep everybody on the same page. So, yeah, and including, like, your earlier example about the solutions architect, mm -hmm. right? So now we've got potentially app developers, people who typically um, have never dealt with a data catalog, certainly have never sourced with one. They probably know anything about them, but um, they could be, you know, those new consumers. It sounds like they already are based on yeah. their experience. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about it is if they start to publish different, you know, data products and stuff and they work together, um, they're going to have to somewhere along the line, I think it's going to become a necessity. Right. And so, and, it, and it'll also just, it'll make it so much easier kind of like we talked about, like the, you know, when you have a web service contract, well, now you have the metadata um, contract, call it, to drive those kind yeah. of connections. So it's, yeah, it's going to be important that people are on, like you said, on the same page when it comes to rolling these out, because you can't, you can't just be um, developing things in a silo and hope that they're all going to connect up and everything's going to be, be great. Yeah. Yep. Need something to tie it all together. Exactly. Yeah, right. I agree. Well, hey, Mr. Meyer, I really appreciate the time. Thanks for joining. These are always great chats, Bob. I appreciate everything that you're doing with your uh, with your podcast. I learned so much from it. So keep going. This is really great. Much appreciated. All right, folks. Uh, thanks for listening and watching. Uh, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Until next time, see you later.